We are in Math, uh, Matthew, Mark chapter 3, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the servant. The Bible speaks of Jesus, the servant of God, my servant. And we're in chapter 3, and already he's in trouble. We don't get into much detail in Mark, as we do with Matthew or Luke, even John. Matthew deals with the Jewish king. Mark deals with, with the servant. Luke will deal with the man, Christ Jesus. Uh, John will deal with <clears throat> Jesus, God. And he entered again into the synagogue. And there was a man there which had a withered hand. And they watched him. <laughs> they watched him. They're in the synagogue. Aren't they supposed to be there with service? Aren't they supposed to open up the, the, the law and study the, the law and learn from the scriptures, learn the, the history of, of Israel, what they're supposed to do? No, they're sitting there watching him. Whether he would heal on the Sabbath day. So Jesus now has got this wherever he goes as a servant. He is helping and taking care of and serving the people. And they know it. That they are in the synagogue and you watch him. It's the Sabbath. He's going to heal somebody. That they might accuse him. Oh, that's okay. So we go to synagogue. Jesus is there. So we take all our mind off the synagogue to watch Jesus. And the main aspect of synagogue is that we might catch him to do something wrong. You know, again, I, like I said, I'll bring Mark up to the church age. There are Christians who will sit in a church service and they'll wait for somebody to do something wrong. They'll wait for them to have the wrong dress. They'll wait for them to say the, the, the wrong words. I know somebody who, well, you know, he didn't, he didn't say that right. Okay, well, Here's a, I don't know, a simple book called Numbers. You start in chapter one and you can go 10 chapters in Numbers. We'll see how well you read the Bible. This is not the aspect to be going in the synagogue. You're supposed to be learning about God. While watching God and waiting for God to do something wrong. <laughs> what? what? What did I just say? Well, I'm not going to church because there's hypocrites. Well, you'll be one more. And he said unto a man that had a withered hand. Okay, withered, it, it's scrunched up. There's no use. The hand is dead. Okay? Now, why he chose this man, I don't know. He says, stand for. So in the middle of synagogue, here's a man that has a dead hand. Jesus looks at him, and Jesus knows what's going on. He knows everything. Stand up. He is going to be causing trouble. Well, you know, you, you say things, and you preach things, and you and it gets people upset. So did Jesus. I can rightfully wear, what would Jesus do? If I had enough gall and things, I would love to go into church and kick over the, the, the table that sells the CDs, cassette players, whatever they sell today, and say, that's what Jesus did. He says unto them, them that are watching him, them are supposed to be learning the scriptures, he just says unto them. Now, he does, uh, Matthew and Mark and Luke and John the Pharisees, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes. Mark says them. Doesn't put a Pharisee title. Now we'll see Pharisee in verse 6. But it doesn't say the Pharisees were watching them, the Sadducees. The entire church, the church, I shouldn't say entire, but the church, the group of people, he says unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day or to do evil, to save life or to kill? 
Now, on the Sabbath day, <clears throat> for the priests, they were allowed to do the morning sacrifice, the lamb, and the evening sacrifice of the lamb. They had to do that. They had to bake the bread and put the bread out. That was allowed. Circumcision, if the eighth day fell on the Sabbath, you would do that. Jesus will, in later Gospels, or will come forth and say, well, you know, if, if a lamb falls into a pit, if an ox falls into a hole, if an ass falls into a, a, a burden, would you not help in that amount? Uh, if you're sitting in your house and Uncle J Jacob is choking on his food, well, we can't t we can't do the Heimlich. I don't know if had the Heimlich but we can't save Uncle Jacob because it's the Sabbath. You can't tell Aunt Martha. Uh, you can't have your water break right now. You can't give birth to a baby because it's the Sabbath. Uh, bring the baby in the water break in tomorrow. You can't do that. And my question has always been with the breaking of the law, the breaking of the Sabbath, of the healing of Jesus. What did he really do that he that he broke the Sabbath? Did he take out a scalpel? Did he walk into an OR room? Did he write a prescription? Did he did he bring forth medication? No, he just spoke. He did exactly what he did in Genesis 1. And God said, and God said, and God said. And on the seventh day, God rested. He's doing the same thing. But they, again, there's no presentation of who the they and them are. Held their peace. And when he had looked round about on them with anger, oh boy, Jesus is going to hell. He's going to hell. I mean, he's going to go to hell. He's going to stay in hell. He's a sinner. You know, I'll show you Matthew. Matthew. He said, what on are you saying? You better be careful with your Bible. And it's either 5 or 3. That's 522. Let's see, it's 522. Okay, 522. I got a lousy hand right in my hand. 522. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother shall be danger of judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be danger of a counselor. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be danger of hell fire. I, 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 I skipped something. Some of your modern Bibles will say, whosoever is angry with a brother shall be danger of judgment. They leave out three words. And what's the important cause of three words? Now, Paul will tell us, be angry and sin not. You get angry, just don't sin. Matthew will tell us that Jesus said, if you're angry with your brother, a Jew, without a cause. Just for whatever reason, I, I don't like, you know, I don't like his face. I don't like what, how he acts. I don't care you know, how people like him and stuff like that. I don't like his occupation, whatever he is. That's not a cause. The Bible allows you to be angry with a cause. Don't sin. Now come back over to, to Mark. Mark chapter 3. And when he had looked upon them with anger, all right, if you don't have without a cause in Matthew, Jesus would be condemned to judgment as a sinner. But there is a cause. There is a reason. They are in synagogue, and the only thing they're sitting there is watching him, trying to catch him at his words. He is angry that they're not paying attention to the scriptures. They're not paying attention to the, the service, the, the presentation. So it's, I've been in churches, and it's funny, you're, you're sitting there in church and, and, and the preacher's going on, and you'll see a bumblebee or something, and all eyes are following that bumblebee all over the room. <laughs> And that would get the preacher mad. Hey, listen, I worked hard on this message. 
Will somebody kill that, that, that bumblebee and can we get back on? A preacher would get mad, you know, if, if if he's sitting there and he's got his meshes and you got a couple of women in the back row talking about, oh, you know, I put beef stroganoff and I put gravy in mine and, oh, I put onions and tomatoes. And, you know, they're not even nothing to do. I know one time a preacher was preaching his message and his own children, and right in the middle of the service, he said, listen, boys, at this service, you're going to get a whipping. Anyway, well, he got angry at his children. Yeah, there was a cause. They were acting up. They were doing something. He was angry with those women because they're talking about a recipe. He's angry with those people because they're playing their games on their phone. He's angry with the people because their phone rings in the middle of the service. That's a reason. I'll tell you one. I'll tell you one thing right now. I don't know how people think about me. I know a lot of people think a lot of things about in a church, a white church. You have a black man, black couple, black woman come in, black family, and all man, all you all know, who they think they are. We wouldn't welcome them. That's being angry. There's no cause. That's prejudice. You're allowed to be angry for those that, you know, because their color, their skin is different and all that. But don't sin. I go to those churchmen, hey, listen, we're not having that kind of attitude here. Being grieved, all right, here's the reasoning, for the hardness of their heart. So Jesus had a reason. Don't mess with Matthew chapter 5. Don't change the scriptures. You say, what's wrong with the modern Bibles? They just put Jesus in judgment, judgment that he's a sinner. Matthew 5, 22, and Mark chapter 3, verse 5. He says unto them, stretch forth thy hand. Now, what procedures did Jesus do? Did he stretch the hand out? Did he get the stretching arm machine? Did he, did he do physical? No, he just said, stretch forth thy hand. What is that breaking the Sabbath? That'd be like a man, he's sitting in his house, they're not doing nothing, it's the Sabbath day. He turns to his wife and family, he says, well, you know what, I'm going to go take a nap. You broke the Sabbath. Well, do you realize on some Sabbaths what they some would do is they would actually sit in their home and they would talk about God. They would try to teach the the, the, the father of the family, unlike your churches today. Wouldn't that be some kind of way of breaking the Sabbath, what Jesus has been doing? Oh, Jesus has taught on the Sabbath. Jesus has lectured on the Sabbath. He has walked on the Sabbath. But as soon as he comes forward, People getting healed on the Sabbath. And he stretched it out. Uh, excuse me. Wait a minute. His hand is dead. Jesus says, stretch for thy hand. And you say, well, isn't there Christians out there? And rightfully so. Maybe I would say it someday. Or maybe I have said it. God is asking me to do something I can't handle. There it is. Jesus is asking this man to do something he cannot do. I don't know how long his hand has been like this, but he can. He told that man to, uh, with the palsy, take up thy bed and walk. Uh, excuse me, he can't. He says to a dead girl, he says, Tabitha, come on. It means arise, get up. Uh, oh, wait a minute, Jesus. Oh, that's ridiculous. She's dead. And there are times of the scriptures. When I mean scripture, I mean, you can relate to a scripture. God's going to ask you to do something, and you can't. It has to be God. 
It has to be God that gets the glorification, not you or anybody else. There are people today with, with all four stages of cancer, and they have been healed, not by medicine, not by chemo, not by, by God. They've gone into the doctor's visit one time. Hey, you, you got cancer? Oh, man, you know? Come back. We're going to send you for tests. Come back, and we'll, we'll look at what we can do. And they go back to the doctor's office, and he says, I can't believe it. Guess what? You see this x-ray here? Yeah, there's the cancer. You see this x-ray? Yeah, it's not there no more. And yes, there will be time. And you know that, that, that the scripture verse over God will God will not give you anything you can't handle. What do you do with this case? Now think about this man. Think about faith. He's got a dead hand. It's withered. Jesus says, stretch forth thy hand, and he stretched it out. That took faith. And he doesn't question Jesus. He doesn't say, Jesus, well, I can't. <laughs> what are you talking about, Jesus? This man never called on Jesus, according to Mark. Jesus is there. He says to the man with a withered hand, I don't know if he's got it in the sling or whatever he's got it. He's like, hey, Come, come here, stand up. Stretch off the hand. And you say, well, it's like those men that brought that man on the bed for their faith. There is no faith because he's angry with the congregation because they have hardness of hearts. And here's this one man, and he'll walk out that day. Ooh, look at my hand. And his hand was restored whole as the other. He's got two serviceable working hands. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Give, give praise to God. Shout up your hands. Lift up your hands. Let's sing a hymn. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, Jesus, how they might destroy him. That's a great hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise service. Now, there's the Pharisees. They're there. It's it's the Sabbath. It's the synagogue. They're there. He Mark has not mentioned Pharisees in the verse 6. He's mentioned the synagogue and how Jesus is mad at them. And the whole service has been interrupted because every time Jesus goes to synagogue, somebody gets a healing. Somebody gets blessed. That's a fine how they do. Now the Pharisees, a group of people mentioned by my, they go out and they go to the Herodians, and the Herodians are people that favor the Roman government as Jews. They're all for Herod. They're all for Roman government. They're brown noses and sticker uppers of the Roman government. Today you would call them Republicans. I don't care. This Republican ought to be president. We ought to get rid of and and and, and get rid of the entire Democrat Party <laughs> and nothing but Republicans. That, that's what the Herodians are. That the Pharisees, who should be against the Herodians for their love affair with the Roman government, because you're not supposed to have anything to do with Gentiles. Herodians are Jews that are in favor of this Gentile government. And the Pharisees say, hey, boys, come here. In the name of God, Jehovah, we've come together. And that's what the Republicans of America, you know, God bless America, guns, guts in the Bible. Oh, yeah, the Bible, we got to throw the Bible in there. And they fall in love because their candidate quotes from the Bible, holds the Bible, and only doing that because it's a sucker you. How you never see him in a church. Yes, I got one man in mind. I'm not going to say his name. So now the Jewish people are going with the Jewish people or for the Roman government. The Rodians should should be as hated as 
Oh boy. Hey, my name. The um getting a name now. The Samaritans. Samaritans are half breed. They're half Jewish, half Gentile. They mixed marriage. And they were hated. Well, the Herorians are mixed Jews with their Jews mixing with the Roman government. Now, how does now how the Gentiles feel about the Gentiles? Ask Jonah and ask Peter. You know, after Peter's conversion, after Peter gets right, we're not talking about the Gospels. We're talking about in the book of Acts, God says to, to Peter, go to this guy's house, the Italian house, and, and, and Peter's like, oh, no, there's nothing unclean to touch my lips. <laughs> Holy Spirit says, excuse me, Peter. You mind want to stop judging them like that now? Because I'm going to start opening the way to them. Paul was the Gentile to the Gent, and Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. But you know, he had that love affair for this nation, the Jewish people. But he was called to the Gentile, and Paul got in trouble because he went to Jerusalem. God's like three times, "Don't you go? No, that's not you." Paul had a better mission. Jonah. Jonah, I got a message. I want you to go to Nineveh. I want you to tell them I am gonna, I'm gonna trash them. I'm going to burn them. And Jonah gets on the ship and heads the other direction. Jonah dies and goes to hell. Is resurrected, resurrected out of the well. He's all right, God, I'll go. He goes and preaches. I think it was eleven words, something like that. And then he goes sits underneath the tree and watches. All right, come on, God, bring on the fire. I got, I got a bag of marshmallows. Uh, Oh, maybe I need a stick. All right, I got the marshmallows, I got the stick. Where's the fire? Oh, come on. Those dead dogs are... Re come on, they put sackcloth on the animals, God. They're mean, they're wicked, they're nasty. And God's like, they're a lot better than what my people are. And the clothes of, of, of Jonah is he is angry like the Pharisees. I've met Christians like this. I've met Christians that they had somebody and they prayed for somebody and they witnessed to him. Somebody else came witnessing to him. They they watered and that person got saved and they got all mad. Oh, how dare you? One was a preacher. So in Mark chapter 3 already, the man that is called, the God that is called, the half fully God, and the half fully man, I can't explain, he's, he's fully God, he's fully man. He has a God nature and he has a human nature, all in one. Chapter 3, they are angry with him. Because he's done something right, but to them it's wrong. And you got to look back at all these people get mad at him for, for healing on the Sabbath. Have they not ever done anything to help somebody on a Sabbath? But Pilate will tell us it's because of envy. He's got more people. Listen, we've already seen John the Baptist had disciples. The Pharisees have disciples. Jesus has 12 disciples and he's with multitudes. Now be careful, because the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes, they want the multitudes that Jesus is getting. And today's church, they want the people. Go out, don't tell them the gospel, don't tell them about Jesus, invite them to church. Bring them to church. Look, we got we got gospel tracts with the church name on it, with the church address. We got the pastor's pretty picture. We even got his wife's picture. Look at our church. Look at the lovely grass and, and the guys out there with tweezers and cutting the grass so much. Look how wonderful. And we got brand new pews and, and we we have done all this work. Look how great the church is. What happened to the gospel that Jesus said we were to preach? I mean, okay. 
by your congregation. Do they know about your church? Yeah, many people know about your church by your congregation. All right. By your congregation. Do, do a lot of people, do they know about your preacher? Yeah, they know about the preacher. How many of your congregation, the people going out and told them about Jesus and told them about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? We're coming up in two weeks. They're going to celebrate Easter. Now, this year, which you say, well, Stanley, how come you're not posting a lot of things in Easter? Because this year, if you take Passover, the official date of Passover, three days and three nights actually brings you to Sunday, which is Easter. This ha I don't know how often this happens, but this year it comes out like that. And for the Christian, it's not Easter. It's the resurrection of Jesus Christ three days and three nights after the Passover. For the world and the Baptist church that has Easter and eggs and bunnies, you overridden the resurrection by Easter. And we're getting to all these groups of people. That's what we're talking about in verse 6. They get together against Jesus. Friend, I am a doctor of theology. I went to school. I had classes. I had to write essays. I had to write commentaries. I had to take tests. I had to read. I had to study just as much as everybody else in the ministry. I had to read two books, Babylon, Mystery Babylon, and uh, the, the two Babylons. I had to read those two books. Surprised I didn't get a brain. I had to take tests on those books. I had to write essays on those books. And uh, the two Babylon, that guy loaded, loaded, loaded all the information that you had to read. And we had to read it all. The footnotes. We had to read the footnote. This came from this doctor. This came from this archaeologist study. This term goes back. And listen, I had to do the Hebrew, the Greek, and the Babylonian with that book. It gave me a headache. And today, scholars override the work just by, well, you know, Esther is not really, I mean, Esther is not really Easter and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, he made the mistake here and that. So when you put on Facebook Esther, Ishtar and Easter, the fact checkers will come up, the Roman Catholic fact checkers will come up and slam you, as will the Baptist preacher. Because the congregations that only come twice a year, they love Easter. I have yet found one Baptist church to celebrate the feast days of the Bible, but they will celebrate the feast days of the Roman Catholic Church and Babylonia. What's wrong with that? And that's everybody getting under the work of the Pharisees, the Herorians, the Sadducees, and the scribes, and they got one enemy, Jesus Christ. And they're always tagging around with Jesus. The Baptist Church tags around with the doctrines and the Bible and all that, but they're they're not for it. They're looking for an excuse. And we had the biggest excuse come up with the Baptist Church. I, well, I forget two or three years ago. The thing called COVID nineteen that shut down many of the churches. We can stay home and watch church on TV. And it's funny because, you know, like, you know, we got this great live stream. All these people get out there. And I read uh, in Christian Today and I read in other things to prove the fact is we're, we're out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. That's Bible. Is a lot of times they will they will open up their face, uh, Facebook, they will open up their, their live stream. They'll start watching church and say, you know what? I've heard that message. I've seen that message. I don't like that message. And they'll go find something else. And they'll go find another church, and as soon as the preacher there does a, says something they don't like, and then they go find somebody else, then they go watch their movies. Yeah, you may get 100 hits. Problem is, if 100 hits is only 2, 3, 4, 5, maybe 15 minutes, 
that don't do you no good. I, I listen. I can't get to church every other week, so I will watch my church, and I watch other times when we're in another church. I'll be on that live stream. You know, say you know there are eight people watching this live stream, and you get five, ten minutes later. Now there's seven. You get fifteen, twenty minutes later. Now there's five. You know, the ten little nine little eight little Indians. And when you come to the end of that video and it comes pops up and you go like it and share it on your Facebook, you say, oh, you know, we had 12, 12 visitors. Uh, yeah, but half of them were only five minutes. How long were these Pharisees here? I'm going to stick in verse 6 for a moment. Because I think Mark in chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, I think he's talking about the people in the church. I think Jesus was antagonizing and making very upset. He's interrupting the service. I mean, come on. You're really going to walk into a Southern Baptist church wearing a King James 1611 Bible shirt? Really? I mean, come on. We know where you stand on the Bible, and we allowed you to be in our church service and like that. But don't send gospel tracts to all the church members. And I'm going to stick with you guys who think you couldn't get rid of my, you couldn't get rid of me. And then I find out the guy's going to retire. He's going to take his RV and go retire. You liar. You liar. And you got churches. Uh, I, what church I went in. He, he called up the pastor I went to, and the pastor, well, you know, he don't like birthdays and Christmas and all that. Yeah, thank you. Save me the trip for saying it. And the, and the pastor, well, I, you know, I hope it don't bother. We do that. Hey, you do what you want. I mean, you want to do wrong. I won't raise a foot. If somebody asks me my opinion, how I feel about Christmas and all that, I'm going to tell them. Now, I'm not going to chop my own, my own neck off. But, you know, during church service, you say something like Easter. I'm shaking my head. I, everybody in the back row sees that. And what they're doing is they're getting together against Jesus. This is the religious folks. It's the religious folks that put Jesus on the cross. Oh, you know, I, I go to church, our church. Yeah, your church. History. Well, what's the church history? The Catholics, the, the, the Congregationalists, the Anglicans have mistreated, has even taken property away, have even forced abandonment, has even killed and tortured Bible believing Christians. Because now they're going to do it to Jesus. And the next step they do after that in the book of Acts, they're going to do it to the disciples. And that runs throughout church history. But Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea. He did this big rock. He just walks out of the building. Boom, he's gone. <clears throat> and the great multitude from Galilee followed him from Judea. So here's these multitude. Here's the mega church. And he hasn't told his disciples go out and tell them about our church because he's got no standing church. He's got no one location. And they have the greatest preacher of all time who is God. But he doesn't tell the disciples, go, you know, go out rep. <laughs> And he's not doing it for the money. As far as the, the ministry of the church, find me a place where Jesus mentions about money. And from Judea. So Galilee is north. Judea is south. From Jerusalem, that's central. That's the capital. Indomitia is Greek. Woohoo! Dun, 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 dun. You learned the Greek language today. It's Edom. Esau. 
That's on the other side of Jordan River. Woohoo! You learn Greek. From beyond Jordan. They about tired of signing. All right, so in the and beyond Jordan, that is on the east. Tyre and Sidon are major seaports on the Mediterranean Ocean that's on the west. So as far as east is from west, we have been cleansed of our sins. A great multitude. So there are Gentiles there, Peter. <laughs> now there are Jews in Tyre and Sidon, but there are also Jews, I mean Gentiles in Tyre and Sidon. Notice how Mark is. Mark moves in out of where Matthew is. Mark will start bringing in Gentiles. They were there. When they had heard what great things he did. What's that? Well, he, he healed, just healed the man with a lame arm or a hand. Uh, he cast out devils. The, the lepers are cleansed. The, 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 the blind can see. The, the deaf can hear. The tongue is loose. And, all kinds of things came on to him. So they're not preaching the gospel. They're preaching how good Jesus is. But the disciples that we've read about are sent out preaching the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. And he spoke to his disciples. That a small ship should wait on him because of the mountain. You guys, go over and get this boat. Hold on for me. I'll be over in a moment. At least they should throng him. That's pushing the side, you know, elbow in the ear and into the side. Can you imagine uh, when you say something like that? Let's, let's read the Bible for what it is. Can you imagine at the end of the day, the disciples and Jesus, oh man, my side hurts. What? All those people kept bumping into my side. And, you know, I hurt my side the other day. Oh, that's okay. I got a couple of my elbows in my eye. Push, shoved. They're, they're pushing sick people out of the way so they can get up to Jesus. I mean, I don't think this is orderly. For he had healed many. Not all. Because he can't heal those that don't have the belief or faith. In so much that they pressed upon him. See that? Elbow and push it. Here's a fist in the face and get out of my way. I need to be healed. As many as plagues. Now, why touching him? Well, we read about a place where a woman touched the hem of this coat and she was healed. That got out. Hey, listen, all you got to do is touch. That woman that touched the hem of his coat had to fall on the ground and reach her hand out there to touch him because there's so many people around him. There are probably people getting injured just being by Jesus. Oh, by the way, Jesus, I came here. You know, I can't hear. You want to, my ribs from these people. <laughs> Unclean spirits. When they saw him, Jesus fell down before him and crying, saying, Thou art the Son of God. <laughs> That's funny. Unclean spirits believe more than the Jehovah Witnesses. And he straightly charged them, the unclean spirits, that they should not make him known. I, it, listen, he gives them liberty to keep speaking. They're going to be speaking more than the Jehovah Witness. That's the Son of God. That is God. And he has a throne. Shut up, guys. Shut up. Why would Jesus have the unclean spirits shut up? You don't want people running around Jerusalem say, listen, you know, unclean spirit. I got saved by unclean spirit. The devil led me to Jesus. Is that not the new age movement today? Angels and devils and 
butterflies and unicorns and the, the Pentecostal church and all the other nonsense stuff out there. You ever hear some of their testimonies? You ever hear uh, how they got saved? And they're mumbling, jumbling, they're jumping in the water, they're doing the hula dance. That ain't Jesus. You're not going to get saved by the devil's music. And you're not going to get saved by the devil's crowd. Now, the devils are saying, hey, listen, that's the son of God. James will tell us that the devils fear and tremble before God and Jesus Christ. That's quite interesting. Because they, they fear and tremble and know who God is and know who the son is. And yet they still rebelled against God and his son are going off into hell <coughs> with no salvation. And you got people in, and I, and I mean religion, any church, any movement, any program, they're out there doing the unclean spirits, professing to know and there are people that claim, I know Jesus, but you know, but Jesus doesn't know you. And reality is, you may profess to know the Son of God, the unclean spirit. And reality, when they're coming to speak, Jesus is saying, shut up. Don't say nothing. And I know Christians to be profess to be Christian. And, and, and a couple of mine just say, listen, all right, you profess to be a Christian and you're going to live like that. Just keep your mouth shut. Don't tell other people you're a Christian. Oh, are you saying? No, I'm not saying you saved the law. But if you're going to profess to be a Christian and live like that, shut up. Because you're doing more harm than good. These devils, if they speak, they'll do more harm than good because then they'll start turning to the unclean spirits. And they do. They got the Ouija board. In Massachusetts somewhere, there's this great monument dedicated to the Ouija board. And but they won't listen to the healthcare professionals where they say, how, how many of these people end up in the emergency room and they're, they're sick, they're not well, they, 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 don't, they don't know. And it'd be like, they, 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 you know, they'll sit there and talk to them, take their blood pressure and, and say, well, what happened then? Well, we were fooling around with a Ouija board. And they end up in the emergency room. But that's not publicized. Don't let an unclean spirit speak to you. No matter what, the, an unclean clean spirit, unclean devil is, is speaking, trying to use you, whatever way, and I'm not saying they can't, I'm not saying they will, but if you ever feel that unclean, just say, in the name of Jesus, shut up. Martin Luther, at one time, he's sitting in his room, and you, you can go where his place is, and this, whatever you want, came up, he says, hi, I'm Jesus. Not so many words. He said, I'm Jesus. Martin Luther picked up his inkwell and said, oh, you'd be, uh, just, uh, bam, threw that inkwell at that Jesus and get out of here. My Jesus is sitting on the throne. Don't mess with him. In today's church, they'll play with the unclean spirit. Today's church, I mean, you go look at their Facebook. I know this Christian. All right, you want to know a Christian? Open up their Facebook, go things and things they like. Look at their books. And notice how many Harry Potters. Run the, the, the witch woman or whatever it's called. Look at the books, look at the movies, and look at the music. It's unclean spirits. And friend, I'm allowed, I'm not allowed to judge you, but I'm I'm allowed to say, your salvation. <laughs> you know. We're getting to a realm here in Mark. We're stepping out of the Jewish land, and we're in all the land now. And we can, I can bring Mark into the church and bring the church into Mark. The church today, the last to see in church, according to Revelation chapter 3, is Jesus Christ is standing outside the church knocking. 
And if he's standing outside the church, he's not inside the church. Who's inside the church? Satan's inside the church. And the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians 11, says that there are preachers out there. There are ministers out there. There are people in the pulpit and in the podiums. They're Satan's men. And the people are listening to them. The number one way to find out if, if, if you've got an unclean spirit, here I go. If your religious leader of the congregation, not Sunday school, of the congregation, if it is a woman, right there, bingo, need no more. I assert a woman should not assert the authority of a man. A woman preacher is not allowed. She's not allowed in the pulpit. She's not allowed on the television. She's not allowed. 